Hello everyone, welcome to today's webinar, Maternal and Child Oral Health Advocacy and Promotion. Um, before we get started, please note that all lines are, are on mute. Um, there will be Q&A following the presentation, um, but during the presentation also note that there will be somebody monitoring the questions box, so if you have any issues, please use the questions box located on your control panel to communicate um, with our staff. Um, today we are joined by Beth Lowe, dental hygienist, and Jolene Burtness, health education specialist at the National Maternal and Child Oral Health Resource Center at Georgetown University. Uh, the Resource Center is part of Georgetown University's McCourt School of Public Policy and supports health professionals, program administrators, educators, policymakers, and others, particularly those working in or with state maternal and child health programs with the goal of improving oral health services for pregnant women, infants, children, adolescents, including those with special health care needs and their families. Um, without further ado, I will go ahead and hand things over to Jolene. And whenever you're ready, Jolene, you can begin. OK, can everyone see the slide? Uh, on my screen right now, teaching and reinforcing the importance of oral health. Thanks, Teddy, and good afternoon, everyone. National Children's Dental Health Month creates a great opportunity to increase awareness of the state of oral health in many places. It also offers an occasion to highlight realistic and cost-effective solutions for individuals and healthcare systems alike. So on behalf of my Resource Center team, Beth Lowe and I would like to thank Teddy and the Office of Minority Health for arranging this conversation with you. I also want to thank all of you for taking time out of your day to lean in, learn, and share. Good oral health is essential to overall health. Good oral health improves our ability to speak, smile, smell, taste, touch, chew, swallow, and make facial expressions to show feelings and emotions. However, oral diseases from cavities to oral cancer cause pain and disability for many people. So today we're going to spend some time talking about how we can work together to improve oral health in your communities. Our goal is to provide you with strategies to prevent and manage oral disease in pregnant women infants, children, and teens, including those with special health care needs. We'll also talk about your role as peer educators and the role of others in promoting optimal oral health and overall health. And finally, I'd like to show you how to find helpful partners and resources using the National Maternal and Child Health Oral Health Resource Center's website. In 2000, U.S. Surgeon General David Satcher released a report on oral health revealing a little-known fact. Dental caries is a common, chronic childhood disease, and it's preventable through basic and inexpensive public health interventions. Still over a decade after the report's release, children's oral health is not on many people's radar screens. Many of us do not understand what defines and contributes to children's oral health, the consequences of ignoring it, or how to improve it. Dental caries is a destructive disease that is caused by a bacterial infection in your mouth. The bacteria that causes caries breaks down sugar in food to produce acid. And over time, the acid removes minerals from the outer tooth surface or the enamel of the tooth. This wears the tooth surface down and over time causes a cavity or hole in the tooth. Cavities are permanently damaged areas in the hard surface of your teeth. If they aren't treated, they get larger and affect deeper layers of your teeth. Cavities can lead to severe toothaches, infections, and eventually tooth loss. Cavities are caused by a combination of factors, 
including health behaviors that lead to poor oral health and barriers that limit our use of preventive interventions and treatment. Health behaviors that can lead to poor oral health include tobacco use, excessive alcohol use, and poor dietary choices. Some barriers that limit someone's use of preventive interventions and treatment include limited access to and availability of dental services, or perhaps the lack of awareness of the need for care, as well as the costs of care. And finally, fear, whether from community beliefs or from personal experiences, can also influence our attitudes about where and how we get oral care. Teddy, how about we launch a, a poll right now? I just wanted to ask a couple of questions um, because many myths and rumors combined with language barriers can often prevent us from embracing recommendations. So we're going to ask a couple of questions that I'd like to, if all of you can take a moment to answer and see if we can get fact or fiction. Okay, folks, so the first poll is up. The question is, baby teeth are not important, they just fall out. Is that a fact or a myth? We're going to leave about 10 more seconds for the answers to come in. Baby teeth are not important, they just fall out. Uh, please use, please use the use the poll, not the questions box to answer. Sorry about that. Um, five more seconds. All right. Okay, the poll is closed. Can you see it, Jolene? Uh, no, I cannot. Sorry about that. Um, okay. So we have seven, baby teeth are not important, they just fall out. We have 7% who say that is a fact, and 93% who say it's a myth. Well, fantastic. This audience knows that baby teeth are indeed, they play a significant role in our health, in children's health and development. They facilitate our speech, they support kids' nutrition, they also help to preserve space in the jaw for permanent adult teeth. Oral health issues are common in kids and young children and can lead to pain and infection along with trouble sleeping, difficulty concentrating, and even emotional distress or feeling bad about the way we look. Establishing healthy oral habits at an early age, including regular checkups, can set a child up for a lifetime of good oral health. Uh, Teddy, can we maybe do the next one? Is there another one you'd like to put up? Sure. The next fact or myth is tooth loss is part of aging. Fact or myth? Tooth loss is part of aging. Okay, we have 10 more seconds to get your answers in. Last bit. Okay, so tooth loss is part of aging. We have 27% who think this is a fact and 73% who think it's a myth. All right. Great. Well, indeed, tooth loss is not inevitable. More people are keeping their natural teeth for a lifetime, and that losing our natural teeth can also affect nutrition, our enjoyment of food, speech, and self-esteem. So the important thing to remember is that we can keep our teeth for a lifetime by continuing to practice good oral care at home and planning ahead for extended health care needs, including oral examinations. 
even if we wear dentures and cleanings to prevent disease. So today, one of our objectives was to talk about prevention strategies. And what do we mean about when we say prevention? Prevention strategies are designed to ensure that a disease or the disease process fails to become clinically evident. Primary prevention are arguably the most cost-effective healthcare measures because they eliminate the need for further treatment as well as pain and suffering associated with disease. Secondary prevention occurs when the focus shifts from preventing the beginning of disease to preventing the progression of that disease. It's also highly cost-effective in that effects of the disease can still be minimized, but it also requires early recognition and treatment of the disease process. Dental caries is especially common in children, teens, and older adults, but anyone can have caries, including infants. Dental caries is an important oral health indicator it's a key measure for monitoring progress toward our national health promotion goals. These goals include reducing the proportion of young children who have dental caries, including children with untreated. Good self-care, such as toothbrushing with fluoridated toothpaste and professional treatment is key to good oral health. The American Dental Association recommends starting to brush with fluoride toothpaste as soon as an infant's first tooth comes into the mouth. And for most babies, this happens between about ages 6 and 10 months. The ADA recommends using a smear of fluoride toothpaste for infants and children under age 3 and a pea size amount for young children ages 3 to 6. So if you're wondering what that might look like, this photo shows a picture of a smear of fluoride toothpaste on a child-sized toothbrush. And this is what a pea-sized amount of fluoride toothpaste looks like. Having children brush their teeth helps them develop good oral hygiene habits that can last a lifetime. Seeing parents brush with them helps them understand that toothbrushing is important. Brushing together helps parents make sure their children spend enough time brushing. However, it's important to keep in mind that young children don't develop the fine motor skills necessary to brush their teeth well until they're about seven or eight, or about the time they learn to tie their shoes. To help children form healthy habits, it's good for them to brush their teeth with an adult supervising. Those of you in the audience who work in community-based early childhood education programs like Head Start are in a really unique position to help ensure children receive the benefits of toothbrushing. You can incorporate supervised brushing in your program day and work with parents to help parents and children develop a twice-daily toothbrushing habit at home. The American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry recognizes dental caries as a common chronic disease resulting from an imbalance of multiple factors over time, as we spoke about earlier. To decrease the risk of developing caries, the AAPD encourages both at home, and professional preventive measures. Did you know that these measures include establishing a dental home within six months of eruption of the first tooth and no later than 12 months of age? But what we also have to keep in mind that is, is that a dental home is more than having an oral examination. A dental home provides a full range of routine oral health care that includes consistent, coordinated, culturally competent, and family-focused care that takes into account the strengths and the needs of a child and their family. It also includes assessment for oral diseases and conditions, preventive oral health care, such as fluoride varnish application or fluoride supplements, 
based on the child's risk for developing oral disease. A dental home also includes treatment of oral disease and injuries, guidance on growth and development issues that may affect a child's oral health, like teething and sucking a pacifier or fingers. Information about taking care of a child's teeth and gums, counseling about nutrition, including their food choices and their eating habits, and of course referrals. And when I talk about referrals, we're talking about referrals from oral health specialists as needed, as well as referrals to health professionals for general health care that may be identified in a dental home. Early dental visits help to teach kids that oral health is important, and children who receive quality oral health care early in life are more likely to have a good attitude about oral health professionals and dental visits. The National Survey of Children's Health found that nationwide, about a little over half of children ages 1 to 5 had one or more preventive dental care visits within the past year. So about half of young children did not have a preventive care visit. State programs such as the state Title V MCH health programs have long received the importance of improving the availability and quality of services to improve oral health for children. I encourage you to work with your state programs. You can help monitor and guide service delivery and assure that all kids have access to preventive oral health services. Coordinated efforts such as these endorse the fact that good health is not possible without good oral health. Coordinated efforts are long overdue. The Institute of Medicine outlined solutions to reduce, reduce existing oral care disparities in groups such as children, ethnic minorities, and rural populations. And in their recommendations, they suggested integrating oral health care into overall health care. They also recommended recruiting underrepresented minorities into dental education programs and making community-based care an educational requirement, meaning that we are to treat diverse populations in different settings. Those of you who are providing primary care or who work in primary care settings are well positioned to support preventive care and reduce the impact of a wide variety of oral conditions, especially dental caries. Because young kids visit family physicians and pediatricians more often than they visit a dentist, it's important for these health professionals to understand the disease process, how to prevent the disease, and interventions available to them and families they serve to maintain and restore health. Nurses and physician assistants can also screen for oral disease and deliver preventive services. Teddy, should we try another fact or fiction? There's an awful lot of misinformation and advice given based on anecdotal experience or emotion. So let's consider another. All right. Fact or myth, oral health doesn't affect my overall health. Now we've probably gone over this quite a bit. So the mouth, of course, is an integral part of our bodies and it's important to our overall health and well-being. So we have about 75% of the votes in. So we'll allow about five more seconds. Okay. All right, I think I see where this is trending. <laughs> Let's certainly hope so. so We've really oral health reiterated health. that many times. Right, and you did a, an amazing job uh, <laughs> because 100% of the audience selected myth. Great. Now, let's try one more. Okay. 
All right. Um, oh, okay. If I'm not in pain, I don't need to see the dentist. Um, it's a unique spelling, but the word is dentist. If I'm not in pain, I don't need to see the dentist. Fact or myth? So, Jolene, either you're a really great presenter or these questions are layups. <laughs> that one is probably a pretty simple one that we do not wait until we're in pain. But unfortunately, that is what a lot of people do do. They wait until they have pain, which means that there's really an, a serious infection. And that's something that we definitely want to prevent from happening. We want regular examinations where dentists can monitor the health of our teeth and soft tissues over time before the pain, we get pain. So once again, oral health is key to overall health. We get it. But also understanding that it is important at all stages of life. But in, it is particularly important at certain times in our lives. Pregnancy is a unique period that is characterized by complex physiological changes. And it's important for women to understand that these changes may adversely affect our oral health. During pregnancy, estrogen and progesterone levels increase. And this increase in hormones can exaggerate the way gum tissue reacts to the bacteria in our mouths. This condition is often referred to as pregnancy gingivitis. Other possible issues that a woman may experience during pregnancy include dry mouth or perhaps the oral effects of iron deficiency anemia. And some women may experience morning sickness and in such case if they're vomiting frequently, they could also develop tooth erosion or a wearing away of the enamel from the frequent contact with acid. Many women see an obstetrician gynecologist as their primary care provider. This creates a great opportunity for OBGYNs to educate women about the importance of oral health because they see them throughout their lifespan, including during pregnancy. As part of routine prenatal care, providers should review these two questions with all pregnant women at every visit. Do you have a dental home? and do you have any pain or problems with your mouth? Providers can encourage all pregnant women to schedule a dental examination if it has been more than six months since their last examination or if they have any oral health problems. You should refer women for oral health care in a timely manner with a written note or call as that would be the practice with referrals to any medical specialist. It's important to establish relationships and communities between prenatal care and oral health professionals. This helps to facilitate a collaborative approach to women's overall health needs. It's also important for prenatal care providers to be aware of patients' health coverage for dental services in particular during pregnancy so that referrals to an appropriate provider can be made. We have to keep in mind that state Medicaid coverage for oral health care during pregnancy varies considerably. A few years ago, the National Maternal and Child Oral Health Resource Center convened a meeting of experts to discuss oral health care during pregnancy. This meeting was funded by the Health Resources and Services Administration and was in collaboration with the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and the American Dental Association. The meeting resulted in a national consensus statement that communicates a very important message. Receiving oral health care during pregnancy is safe throughout pregnancy and is effective in improving and maintaining oral health. The American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists later issued a committee opinion acknowledging that oral health is a vital component of general health and should be sustained during pregnancy and throughout a woman's lifespan. So 
If you're a women's health professional, we encourage you to look for opportunities to educate your peers about the significance of oral health. Help them to recognize oral health problems and inform them about procedure safety during pregnancy. This will help them feel more comfortable with evaluating oral health and more likely to address it with their patients. Women also need to be reassured that prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of oral conditions, including dental x-rays and local anesthesia, are safe during pregnancy. Conditions that require immediate treatment, such as extractions and restorations, are also safe during pregnancy. Delaying treatment can only complicate things. The preconception period provides a great opportunity to intervene earlier to optimize the health of potential mothers and fathers. Preconception care aims to target existing risks before pregnancy, so resources can be used to improve reproductive health and optimize our knowledge before we conceive. These interventions include prevention and management of infectious diseases and screening for and managing chronic conditions, and including dental caries. In early 2014, the CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, estimated the baseline prevalence of 38 preconception health indicators. This indicator on the screen is defined as visiting a dentist or dental hygienist for a teeth cleaning in the 12 months before becoming pregnant. It can be monitored at the state level for ongoing surveillance of the status of preconception health among women of reproductive age. The CDC found that the baseline prevalence of that indicator was about 51%. So just as with young children, only about half of women who are pregnant saw <clears throat> had a preventive dental visit before they became pregnant. And for all reporting areas combined, the prevalence of this indicator varied significantly by age and race ethnicity. For example, about 62% of women ages 35 to 44 reported having their teeth cleaned in the 12 months before pregnancy. This compares to about 41% of women ages 18 to 24. That's about a spread of 20 percentage points. Oral health may not feel like a priority during this phase of life, but it should be. It's important to maintain basic habits, eat healthy, and keep regular dental appointments to ensure that your health will be in great shape for the future. Before moving on, I'd like to take just a moment to recap where we've been and talk a bit about where we're going. First, I defined dental caries. Then, we talked about strategies for preventing and managing caries. We also talked about the role of peer education in reinforcing healthy practices during early childhood and pregnancy and preconception. Now I'd like to share some information about the Oral Health Resource Center. You'll find that I might refer to it as OHRC in the next few minutes. I'd also specifically like to share some key resources that you can easily access from our website at mchoralhealth.org. The Resource Center is funded by a grant from the Federal Maternal and Child Health Bureau to help states and communities address current and emerging public oral health issues. Our activities are primarily organized around four goals that relate to knowledge building, program development, easy to access communication systems, and importantly, collaboration. I'd first I'd like to share, this slide shows a picture of our library um, from our website. And I wanted to talk a little bit about what you, can, you will be able to find if you come to the website and search our library. 
These include conference proceedings, curricula, policies, reports, and standards. And the materials that you'll find in the library might include things from government agencies, national and state organizations, community programs, as well as maternal and child health bureau funded projects. You can use the library to assist you in providing education and training, or you might like to do some research, you're developing a program, or you simply want to stay abreast of what's happening in the field. One of the resources we've also pulled together from many of the materials in our library is this timeline. The timeline traces significant events that have occurred in the United States and that have impacted the oral health and ultimately the overall health and well-being of children, teens, women, and families. You can use this tool to educate students, orient professionals new to the public health or oral health, and remind professionals working in the field about important events that have shaped our history. Each page in the timeline contains a date, a milestone, it includes background information, and information about the milestone's impact. I particularly like a lot of the pictures that are included as well. This is, a, this is our Bright Futures toolbox. And this is kind of one of the first go-to's on our website for many of you. The toolbox highlights materials for promoting and improving oral health of infants, children, and adolescents. You can use it to find oral health information, identify services needed to improve oral health, learn how to develop and implement programs, or find information about training for professionals, providers, and students. This is an example of one of the tools that you can find in our Bright Features toolbox. It's a series of modules that we designed to help people who are working in community-based settings. That might be Head Start programs, home visiting, WIC. It's designed to help you promote oral health in the course of promoting general health. The modules present information about dental caries, the risk factors, and prevention, much of what we've already discussed here today. But they also explain how to perform a risk assessment and screening and highlight guidance that you can share with parents. There's also a companion presentation that's available to assist with training events. The Bright Futures Toolbox points to a variety of different types of resources for learning about oral health and oral health services including videos and even widgets for finding oral health care. We also compile lists of recent materials and websites to help busy people easily find resources on key topics. This is a photo of our library. Many of the topics are listed on this slide. And of course, it includes dental caries. Each of our highlights includes statements supported by references from the recent professional literature. And you might want to use these statements for things like reports, or if you're writing a proposal, you're doing a presentation. They also feature publications that we've developed as well as key websites and materials from others. After you look through all of the resources in each of the highlights, you can use the library search to identify more resources, or you might even like to suggest a resource. We would love that. Or suggest a topic for a resource highlight. The Resource Center also produces materials. And we pull these things together often to, in directories so that you can easily access what's new. Other examples of materials that we produce are policy briefs and papers that describe strategies for action and tip sheets that describe program development strategies. We also work with our partners 
to develop and share materials for pregnant women. This tip sheet is an excerpt from the consensus statement that I mentioned earlier. It communicates the important message that receiving oral health care is safe throughout pregnancy and is effective in improving and maintaining oral health. The tip sheet is currently available in multiple languages including Arabic, Chinese, English, Korean, Portuguese, Russian, Spanish, and Vietnamese. We've also developed this brochure series for sharing with parents. It provides information about the importance of oral hygiene and oral health care during pregnancy and infancy, and also how to ensure that infants and young kids enjoy the best possible oral health. All of HRC's materials can be downloaded from our website in PDF. You're also welcome to photocopy or print them from the PDF. Looking for partners. Keep in mind that we routinely collaborate with others. That's the way we do our work. We gather, develop, and share information and materials. We work with partners to pro also to provide information about organizations, programs, and initiatives, and other groups that can serve as resources. You can find these uh, organizations, such as clearing houses and resource centers, directly linked on our website. We also link to data sources, state offices of oral health, as well as Medicaid provider enrollment information for those who are looking to become providers. So if for some reason you don't find what you're looking for, you can always use our search tool to find other information. And of course, there's always the phone and email. Because with all areas in health, new resources be regularly become available. So I encourage you to continue to visit OHRC's website for the most up-to-date information about practices and policies. You can also stay informed about new resources by subscribing to our email distribution list, OHRC Announcements. We highlight publications, website features, and other news as recent developments occur. Or you can join our conversation on Twitter, subscribe to our YouTube channel, or post our badge on your website. It's a great way to provide a gateway to our homepage. So today in closing, I wanted to mention to say that oral health may begin at home, but it's really up to all of us to also make it a point of focus in our classrooms and offices, in our conversations with our friends and families, and in our communities. If we want to ensure optimal health for all, we need to be able to talk about the importance of oral health in different ways, in different environments, and with different people. Teaching early and often enables children to develop lifelong, sustainable beliefs, attitudes, and skills. And interaction between the home, the school, and the community is critical. It includes interaction between parents, our peers, our teachers, and healthcare professionals. Repetition of information is a key learning principle, and in this case, reinforcing the importance of oral health. I want you to take that home. Teddy, thanks to all of you for this opportunity, and we look forward to working with you. I think perhaps it's time to take some questions. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much, Jolene, for that wonderful presentation. Um, to start things off, um, can you please uh, show the audience um, your contact information uh, one more time and just sure. have that up? Sure the questions, because we get that question a lot. Um, so the first question is, um, I guess on the resources um, your office offers, um, do you guys offer toothbrushes or toothpaste for tabling events, or what kind of materials do you all offer? 
for free. We do not offer toothbrushes and toothpaste. However, we, we do, um, we are able to provide resources to, to help you find those kinds of things. So if you were to just email us, we'd be happy to give us a call. We'd be happy to share that information with you. Okay. Um, the next question is, um, what lower, what materials do you have for lower literacy levels? Many of the materials that I shared earlier, the brochures as well as the tip sheets, are have been created with for people with lower literacy levels in mind. We also do have other resources on our website that if you were to do a search of our, our library, to, just using the advanced search box, um, and type in low literacy, we use that as a keyword as well. So that's a great way for you to be able to easily find those kinds of materials. Okay, just going through some of these. Um, so does your office provide um, early education webinars? So I guess education on um, oral health care? Yes, we absolutely do. In fact, we work quite a, a lot and have over many years now with Head, Head Start programs. And in fact, my colleague Beth Lowe, who is joining us on the phone here as well, um, is working in that area um, in particular. Beth does a newsletter for Head Start programs called Brush Up on Oral Health. And Beth has also participated in other webinars for early care and education professionals. I think it's really an important aspect, and if you were to go again to the website, perhaps maybe I could even show you where that is, um, that you can find lots of resources that, that we're using, including a way to choose curricula for programs, um, the newsletter that I just mentioned. Um, Beth, is there anything else that you would like to share? Well, this also ties into some of the low literacy um, information. We have also produced a handout series for parents called um, Healthy um, Habits for Happy Smiles, and that uh, essentially addresses one topic issue. So if you're counseling a family or working with a family and you're using more of an incremental approach to try to get um, help to improve their oral health care, um, you can take certain topics um, such as pacifier use, uh, weaning, um, you know, a variety of different things, how to position a child to brush their teeth. Um, those are all available on both our website and on um, Head Start's, I'm going to get this wrong, early um, e click. It's, it's called e click, but it's Early Childhood Knowledge and Learning Center. Um, which is the gateway website for many of the Head Start um, materials. Um, if you just Googled Head Start Oral Health, that should get you right into our webpage there as well. Okay, thank you, ladies. Um, Beth, uh, you may be more equipped to answer this question. Um, do you feel the fingertip toothbrush for infants is necessary, and if so, what age would you recommend parents to start wiping the gums, tongue, and cheeks of their infants or children? Um, the fingertip, the the fingertip brushes. I've heard mixed reviews on those because sometimes children can bite down on them and they slide off the parent's finger, and then they become a choking hazard. Um, the best bet is just to start using an infant-sized toothbrush as soon as the teeth appear. Um, in terms of wiping an infant's gums, you can do that as soon after the baby is born as possible. Um, we recommend doing um, wiping the infant's gums primarily because it gets the child used to having someone working in their mouth. And as anyone who's um, dealt with a two-year-old before knows how difficult that can be. Um, so by starting early, it just kind of gets them used to um, having somebody brushing their teeth or working in their mouth. So that's one of the primary reasons that we use that. Um, however, if the finger brushes, they can assure that they'll stay on the finger, that they're okay to use. Um, but, you know, once the teeth first come in, 
it's just fine to use a toothbrush with a smear of fluoridated toothpaste as well. Thank you. Um, Jolene, um, would you mind uh, going to the slide where you listed your partners? Um, sure. We have a question yeah. from the audience wondering if you also partner with uh, the DentaQuest Foundation? We certainly do. That's a very good question, and that is one of the web um, links that you will find on our website too as well. Okay, great. Um, and could you go into um, some detail about tooth loss, um, mainly in the primary or permanent teeth? Um, I guess more so uh, teeth will be lost, right? How do, you, how do you manage that or I guess like mitigate the loss? Certainly. I, what we're trying to talk when we talk about tooth loss and young children in particular and is that the primary teeth are important is that we don't want people to be losing teeth due to disease. You know, certainly teeth do fall out and that is something that happens as the course, natural course of development. But what's very important for us to understand is that it shouldn't be happening due to disease. Um, I'm, if I can step in here a little bit too, um, primary teeth are incredibly important for saving the space underneath the, the saving space for the permanent teeth that are developing underneath them. If teeth are lost early, primary teeth are lost early, the other teeth will tend to drift because they all want to touch each other, so they tend to drift towards the center of the mouth. And when they do that, they then block the space. The space fills in for the permanent teeth that are uh, developing underneath um, the now missing tooth that blocks that space out. So then that leads to extra crowding and what we call malocclusion, where the teeth don't touch together properly so that you can cause problems with bites and speech and all those kind of things. So the really main reason for maintaining um, all of the primary teeth until it's age appropriate age appropriate for them to um, uh, be shed is is to keep the permanent teeth in in occlusion with each other and that there's enough space for them I hope that answers that question okay um. How do you feel about oil pulling for adults? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it's it's pretty much a it's it's not an effective approach for um, maintaining oral health. I mean, the really the the main things for Maintaining oral health is to have optimal oral hygiene, watch your um, sugar intake, your dietary intake, how frequently you eat food makes um, a huge difference in um, how much acid is in your mouth um, throughout the day. The longer, the more frequently you eat, the more often your teeth are going to be bathed in acid. Um, and which will, will end up causing tooth decay. Um, and then actually access to fluoridated water is also incredibly important for adults because we have minute amounts of the fluoride in our saliva and that also gives it a topical effect. So, you know, eating well, using fluoridated toothpaste, brushing and flossing as an adult, um, brushing twice a day and flossing at least once a day is um, really the key factors and also making sure that if you have any dental disease that you have that that fixed um, or restored because tooth decay, when, if a person has active tooth decay, they have a, a much higher burden of the bacteria that causes tooth decay in their mouth and that um, will make the other teeth in the mouth more susceptible to tooth decay. So it's really kind of a folk um, the teeth pulling is more of a, a folk practice that ha isn't really uh, based in any evidence, whereas 
fluoridated toothpaste, fluoride water, um, watching your diet are all definitely um, uh, science-based or evidence-based. Um, and um, kind of along with the first part of your answer to that question, are there things more harmful to teeth than sugar? No, sugar's the I bad guy. <laughs> sugar's I, I the guess bad they mean guy. like daily. I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, sugar's really the bad guy, but we also need sugar. So we have to be smart about how we eat. Um, sugars that are processed sugars are very easy for the bacteria that cause tooth decay in our mouth to break down. Um, Whereas as, um, other sugars, natural sugars, or sugars that are included in uh, the complex sugars that are included in, in almost every food that we eat, that takes longer for the bacteria to break down. Um, each time we eat something with sugar in it, whether it's a natural or complex sugar, the pH level in our mouths goes down um, into the acidic level, and that's where tooth decay can occur. Um, the key is, is you want to see, and the, that, that, sh that acid is in the mouth for about 20 minutes after we eat something. So what we want to do is we want to see high peaks and, and very short low peaks where the, the bacteria or the acid is in our mouth for very short periods of time and have it go back up into the, the um, safe zone or, you know, the zone where it's being buffered. The, um, and so by doing that, minimizing the number of times that we, we consume anything with sugar, including drinks, um, that is going to minimize your risk of developing tooth decay. So sugar is a, a biggie, but we need it. <laughs> so we have to be smart about it. Um, and Beth, do you have information on what a safe amount of sugar is, um, a daily amount of sugar? Um, I'm not sure exactly what it is, but if you check the nutrition standards, um, generally they, they have those. But again, in terms of sugar, the best approach is to, is to look for the more complex natural sugars than, than the um, sugars that are uh, refined or in processed foods. Jolene, do you happen to know if there's a daily recommended amount of, for sugar? No, I don't. I think the answer you provided is, is very good. Okay, thanks. We have about two more minutes, so we're going to get through these last couple of questions. Um, uh, uh, an attendee asked, I have heard that even seltzer with no sugar is bad. Is that true or false? Sounds like a poll question. Yeah, that's a good question. Actually, uh, carbonation, it, it's not so much creating problems with tooth decay. It is, is actually involved in erosion of tooth surfaces, which means that it kind of thins away or makes the enamel that's covering the tooth surface a little bit thinner. And if you drink uh, carbonated drinks um, with... Uh, really regularly and very frequently you can get some enamel erosion um, on the two surfaces and that can uh, of the enamel and so that can cause sensitivity to hot and cold um, can also cause um, teeth to possibly break where the enamel shears off of the tooth surface or it could break off of the tooth surface um, make it very difficult for teeth to hold fillings if they needed to have any kind of fillings but again, this is, is um, a chronic long-term use where you, you're using, having um, carbonated beverages, basically drinking them throughout the day. Okay. Um, and we have a question about coffee. Um, is the discoloration that occurs from drinking coffee, is it damaging to teeth or is it just um, aesthetic? It's just an aesthetic thing. Um, you know, after a while, 
you know, as a practicing hygienist, I've, I've um, had, when I was practicing dental hygiene, I had a lot of patients who had coffee stain, and some of it can be removed, but then some of it becomes um, part of the tooth, or it gets incorporated into the tooth sur surface, and so it can't be um, removed. Um, some people try whitening to do that, and again, there are some issues with that where you can increase your sensitivity and colds and, and other um, issues if you use it a long time. So, But in terms of causing damage to the teeth, it, it really doesn't. It's really more of an aesthetic issue for, for many people. Okay, and final question. Um, are there special, special care needs for pregnant women? Do they need more checkup, dental checkups? Um, is there anything you can recommend? Um, that would depend. That's on a case-by-case -case basis. You know, everybody responds to bacteria differently, and everybody comes into um, a practice with a different set of health um, issues. I mean, some women go through pregnancy without any problems with their teeth and gums, whereas others have a lot, their, their gums react very, um, very quickly and um, to, to bacteria that, you know, comes from, um, to the, the byproducts of bacteria that, that come in contact with the teeth. So it's really on a case-by-case -case basis. I mean, the best advice is to, you know, do what we do every day is to keep our mouths as clean as we possibly can, um, to, you know, see the dentist on a regular basis just to make sure that there isn't anything going on, and to um, treat any um, unmet need as, as soon as it comes up. Um, you know, one of the things that you can do with women who have a lot of morning sickness, because um, with morning sickness, you're, there's a lot of acid in, in, um, in the vomit. And so um, a number of, um, one of the recommendations is to um, use a teaspoonful of baking soda and mix it with water and then swish that through the mouth. Um, and that's probably the only major preventive issue that's different than what we would do normally um, or recommend it for all of us normally. All right, thank you. Um, thank you all for joining us today. That will conclude today's webinar. Um, if you would like to reach Jolene, um, she can be reached. Her email is um, bees and boy, E R, T as in Tom, N E S S as in Sam, J at georgetown.edu. Um, if you would like a copy of today's presentation, of today's PowerPoint presentation, you can email me, Teddy Awusu, at T-O-W-U-S-U at minorityhealth.hhs.gov. Um, and Beth's email is E as an egg, A-L-38, at georgetown.edu. Thank you all for joining us again. Thank you, ladies, um, for a wonderful webinar presentation. And I hope everybody else has a great rest of the evening. Great. Thanks so much, Teddy, and everyone else as well. Thank you, Teddy, and thanks, everybody, for spending some time with us. All right. Bye-bye.